Hello. Well, it's um, it's quite late, so I'm gonna try and keep it somewhat short. But you know how it goes. This could go on a couple of hours before I know it. Uh, one of the comments of um, one of the guys that watches my videos gave me sort of a spark for an idea for the next video, which again relates a little bit to high IQ, but in particular related to the idea of precognition. Now. Uh, precognition is uh, considered science fiction, but I assure you, it's not. Now, if you want all the details, uh, there, there's a lot more of this in, in the book I wrote uh, called Sistema, which you can you can find online or go to my blog, gfilotto.com, or if you just type uh, Sistema, the Russian martial system, uh, and my name, which is at the bottom there, you can you can find it on on Amazon. It's not that cheap because once you buy this, you've got access to forty videos on system and so on. But anyway, you you know I'm not trying to sell you the book. You don't have to buy the book. I'm just telling you there's more information in the book than I'm going to be able to do in the video. Um, because I do like to be thorough and give references when I can. Anyway, um, a precognition is a real thing. Human beings have the ability to sense uh, certain dangerous situations before they happen. Uh, it has been doc quite well documented uh, throughout history in anecdotal form. For example, um, with the Titanic, I remember reading a passage when I was, uh, you know, in my teens, I think, or maybe even, you know, around 10, 12 years old, something like that. Um, the story of a person that had tickets to go on the Titanic and they had a premonitory dream that the Titanic would sink and they um, they didn't go, they refused to, to board the ship, which, you know, was quite a problematic thing at, at the time. Uh, the tickets weren't very cheap and, you know, I, I don't know what the refund policy was, but as a result of not going on that trip, this person uh, lived to tell the tale, so to speak. And you know, that sort of thing is always difficult to prove, but uh, there was a very interesting study, a meta study actually done, and I'm going to read little sections uh, from this uh, from this book now and then. Uh, so the meta study was done by Charles Honerton and Diane Ferrari, like the car. Uh, the title of the of the meta study is called Future Telling a meta-analysis of forced choice precognition experiments, 1935 to 1987. So what these guys did is they took all the studies that had been done to relating to precognition, and they checked the validity of these studies, the methodology that was done. So a meta-study of all the various studies. And what they found, and I don't want to lie to you now, uh, so 30% of the, so they studied, this meta study included, I'm just going to read the little extract here so that you, you get what it's about. Uh, we report a meta-analysis of forced choice precognition experiments published in the English language parapsychological literature between 1935 and 1987. These studies involve attempts by subjects to predict the identity of target stimuli selected randomly over intervals ranging from several hundred milliseconds to one year following the subject's responses. We retrieved 309 studies reported by 62 investigators. Nearly 2 million individual trials were contributed by more than 50,000 subjects. Study outcomes are assessed by overall level of statistical significance and effect size. There is a small but reliable overall effect. 30% of the studies by 40 investigators are significant at the 5% significance level. Assessment of the vulnerability to selective reporting indicates that the ratio of 46 um, unreported studies averaging null results would be required for each reported study in order to reduce the overall results to non-significance. In other words, for this result to be false, they would have to have 46 uh, studies that produce you know, no relationship in order to nullify this. And it goes on and on. But in, in essence, basically, what it comes down to is that 
the overall results show with a p-value of 6.3 times 10 to the minus 25. So 6.3 times 10 to the minus 25th power. So roughly, if you think of a zero, followed by a decimal point, and then 25 zeros, and then the number 63, that's the percentage chance that this is not, uh, you know, a factual reality. So although it's a small result, um, it's, uh, it's there. Now, I have personally experienced precognition uh, that saved my life on at least two occasions. And it is quite widely reported by um, people who have been in combat, in war zones, special ops types people. And there is a guy, an American guy called uh, uh, Mac Crady, who did a study on, on this, hooking up men and women to all sorts of machines that measure heart rate, uh, you know, like your skin conductivity and pretty much everything. And what they did is they showed a se sequence of images to these people, uh, most of which were like, you know, flowers, a dog, trees, but mixed into these uh, images were some really graphic, either very sexual or very uh, violent images. What they noticed, and uh, again, I don't want to waste too much time I don't remember off the top of my head, but if I remember right, it's about one and a half or or two, you know, between one and, and two seconds, something like that. Let me just see if, I've, if I can find it quickly. Otherwise, I'll... Uh, uh, right. So the, the, research, the researcher's name is Roland McCready. Um, he wasn't alone. There was also other guys called Mike Atkinson and Raymond Trevor Bradley. They published a paper detailing the re research on intuition. They call it intuition, but really it's precognition. And the reason they used intuition, in my opinion, is because the word precognition is a little bit loaded and makes people think it's science fiction and blah, blah, blah. The title of this um, is Electrophysiological Evidence of Intuition, the Surprising Role of the Heart. The experiment used 26 people, 11 men and 15 women, to investigate a phenomenon that had already been noticed in previous experiments by others and replicated by different groups of researchers. Now, the replication is important because what has been uh, discovered is that uh, lately, especially in the last uh, decade or two, most of the scientific studies that are peer-reviewed are not reproducible. In other words, bullshit. Less than 50%. So the fact that this this test was reproducible by other um, scientists is is important um, by more than one or two groups, you know. So what this experiment did was it was regarding the body's apparent ability to react to future stimulus between four and seven seconds before actually being presented with the stimulus. So sorry, it's between four and seven seconds, which actually ties in with my personal experience of this stuff. So it's more than one and a half seconds. I think I remember now where the one and a half seconds come from. Um, so what they did is they hooked up these people. Um, the experiment itself consisted in showing a randomized set of 45 images at set intervals. 30 of these were of calm or neutral scenes, such as pictures of natural scenery, but 15 were of an erotic, violent, or otherwise emotionally arousing nature. The subject had a variety of experimental design constraints placed on them to ensure that the results were not adversely influenced by what experimenters and scientific researchers sometimes refer to as a bad design. In other words, they took some time, some, they went to some lengths to make sure that they weren't influencing the observers and so on. Now, and another thing that um, is, is important to note is that, uh, I'll, again, I'll read a piece here. Because positive results in experiments are far more likely to be published than negative results, there is a trend for researchers to be lax in presenting their negative results for publication. In other words, a self-fulfilling vicious circle. None of this is intentional per se, quite simply it is human nature. If you knew that you had to put in the same 50 hours to make a research paper presentable for publication, 
but your chances of it being published were far lower than a completely different paper, one you had positive results on, it's more likely you will present the more likely paper first. Um, so there are statistical models to prevent this sort of thing from happening. And I think these McCready took some care to ensure the experiment's design considerations were sound. In other words, he allowed for this. So this is, I've spoken, uh, I've emailed to this guy and, and he is he's a sound, sound scientist. So I, I, I would trust his results rather than just some random scientist if I hadn't had conversations with him and so on. Plus there's another very important point that I'll come to that tells you that this guy knows what he's doing. Anyway, in the tests, what they found is that the heart rate changed two to five seconds prior to the images with the shocking content being shown. Now, these people didn't know when the image was going to come up, and I don't believe they even originally knew what was going to come up. Now, the interesting thing is that they... Um, the difference between the calm images and the emotional ones was quite evident uh, as a consistent change in heart rate of about 1% when averaged out across all participants. The effect may seem small, but due to the number of trials, it was clearly statistically significant. Now, the interesting thing, and again, I don't want to lie to you because I think this is the... Uh, the one and a half second where this comes in, but if I remember correctly, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not intentionally trying to, to deceive you or anything, but you know, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of information here, so I, I can't find it right now. I didn't prepare to do this video. I was just gonna do it off the top of my head. But um, what they discovered is that they, they also repeated this test after they had trained these guys to be in a, what they call a sort of unified calm state. So where you are, centered if you like and um, what they discovered is when they did this the men no longer had uh, much of, a, of an effect in other words they didn't really their heart rate didn't really change but the women continued to have the effect uh, before the images came up this is very interesting because I think there is a very clear um, biological evolutionary type of situation because you know, as a man, in the two million years of evolution we've had from whether we were monkeys descended from aliens or whatever it is, we've been around quite a long time. And the male of the species is generally tasked with the protection of the female, his young, the other men and so on. However, if as a man, you're always on the go, you're always ready for anything, anything that could be potentially dangerous sets you off, including just a picture on a wall, which clearly cannot be that dangerous, um, you know, you're going to burn out. So the difference between, you know, a nervy, skittish guy that is just going to jump at everything, you know, he, he's not going to rest well, he's not going to sleep well, he's not going to eat well because, you know, he's always scared. But a proper warrior, you know, somebody who's calm, who's clubbed enough enemies or animals or whatever that he kind of knows when it's time to react and when not, will only react to a real impetus to it, not just to like, you know, a false thing, uh, because that gives him the best survival uh, to, you know, if he reacts to everything, he's gonna get caught out short. So he will, a man will generally only react to a real threat. Uh, and again, this is done with precognition. No one really knows how it works. Well, there is a Russian guy that knows how it works, Peter Garayev. Uh, but it's complicated um, and it basically what Peter Garavi says is that our precognition ability stems from our so-called junk DNA which in his opinion and this is my layman's interpretation of it right the the junk DNA has the ability to create uh, miniature temporal wormholes which can gain information from both the future and the past which is why you get things like mediums, which is why things like hypnosis actually have physical changes in the brain and so on. There's a whole bunch of related stuff. And the work that this Peter Garayev guy has done, and I've communicated with him as well directly, is incredible. And I've put you know, some of it in the book. 
Um, and weirdly enough, I didn't know this originally, but uh, Makreti and Gareyev actually worked together um, on another thing, which uh, I only found out sort of by chance because I was talking to both and uh, and it's there was some related information so i said to my you know about the work of this gallery of guy and goes oh, yeah i worked with him we did the experiment that he talks about um we did that at stanford university i was with him and we had laser interferometry and so on going on unfortunately we didn't record it because we did it on a weekend when there was nobody else around just to see if it worked and it worked but then he had to go back to russia and you know we never got a chance to to repeat the experiment but it absolutely worked it's true I, you know i vouch for the guy because peter garyev came up with things that were sounding so crazy that uh, it was just thought to be an internet legend and it isn't you know he sent me his um, his published work in, in in cyrillic in russian he doesn't speak any english and my russian is not up to the to the standard of being able to read uh, that level of stuff especially since he talks about solitonic waves now go on infogalactic and look up solitonic waves if you can grasp what that means fully well done because i sort of get it but you know anyway apparently the our junk dna is kind of like a radio antenna for information from both future and past and can also potentially send information to the future and past and that's why precognition actually is a real thing in some people. A small percentage of people can have this happen to them. Now, the weird thing is that it seems to uh, happen in... Uh, there seems to be some genetic link. I personally believe it's also linked to IQ. Uh, for example, I have it. Uh, my father has it. Uh, you know, we have the sense of being able to sort of feel when something bad is coming or we know when somebody we care about is not doing well or something's gone wrong and i've had outright uh times when just a blatant result of absolute telepathy happened and there is a guy whose name i'm trying to remember he's a professor i think in canada i can't remember i it might be toronto university or columbia i can't remember the name of the university and what is his name i have one of his books somewhere but i'm not sure that i've got it here it might be packed away he's a professor he's a tenured professor and he talks about telepathy there is a youtube video that he did it was one of his lectures it's about two hours i think called no more secrets and hopefully his name will come to me later in the video Anyway, this guy has come up with the best theory of how telepathy works that I've ever come across. And it is scientifically sound, makes sense, and the experiments that he's done to verify it, in my opinion, are um, tend to bear it out. Uh, if I can't remember his name, I'm going to try and put it at the, at the bottom of the, um, of the video in the notes, on the description. Um, if I remember to do it. Anyway, um, I've had instances, like one that is, is, I remember very clearly because I've had several, but one that I remember very clearly was uh, with my brother. And I was in South Africa at the time, he was in the United States. I was taking an exam, an engineering exam. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I used to get nosebleeds regularly, almost like daily. And as I got older they weren't as bad you know it didn't happen as often so i was in my mid-20s i think yeah probably early 20s something like that and i was writing this engineering exam and um all of a sudden i got a vicious nosebleed that just started coming down you know pouring out of my nose so i asked the monitor listen can i just go wash my face because literally i'm just leaving a pool of blood on my on on my desk and i managed to avoid getting the paper completely covered in so I said, yeah, but I have to come with you. So I said, okay, yeah, yeah, I was fine. I went to the toilet to wash my face with cold water and, you know, wash my hands and so on. And as I splashed the water in my face and I looked up in the mirror, in my mind, I had an exact, precise, clear view, thought, feeling, sensation that at that exact moment, my brother, who was on the other side of the planet, was also having a nosebleed. And I checked the time. I checked the time because I knew there was a time difference. And I thought, I'm so certain of this, but I, I need to check, you know, because maybe it's just my crazy brain. Went back, finished the exam. That evening, when I went home, I called my brother. And, uh, you know, this was sort of 
very early 90s, I think. Yeah, early 90s, maybe 92, 93, something like that. So the internet was very new. You know, it was, I actually called them, you know, on, on a landline. We didn't, don't think we had mobile phones yet. Um, I called him up and I said, listen, did you have a nosebleed last night? And he said to me, you know, I, I heard him pause and he was like, how the hell could you possibly know that? I said, well, did you or didn't you? And he said, yes. And I said, well, do you remember what time you had it at? He says, yeah, I remember because I, I went to wash my face. And when I came back to bed, I looked at the clock and he told me the time, um, you know, which was within five or 10 minutes because he told me, no, I went to wash my face. Yeah, that's right. It was within like five minutes, if I remember right, five or six minutes of the time that I checked on my clock. And I said, just tell me exactly what happened. And he said, but why? I said, just tell me exactly what happened. I wasn't going to tell him why, because I didn't want to, you know, for him to like bullshit me or whatever, you know, not, not that he would, but I just didn't want to influence his, his answer. And um, he said to me, well, I had a nosebleed, you know, I couldn't breathe properly. I said, I wiped my nose, I woke up, it was, I had blood on my hands, so I switched on the light and I realized I had blood on my hand. Uh, so I went to the toilet, I washed my face, I took a piss, I sort of wondered why the hell I was getting a nosebleed because, you know, it went into my throat, that's what woke me up. So then I went back to bed and I looked at the clock and it was, you know, whatever, two point two a five minutes past 2 a.m. or whatever. And... Um, that was like, again, five minutes, you know, out of the, after the time that I said, but he'd got up, gone to the bathroom, washed his face, had a piss, came back roughly five minutes, right? So I told him I had a nosebleed at the exact same time. That's the only reason I knew. There's no, and he says, well, there was no other way you could know because there was nobody with me. I was by myself, sleeping by myself. I didn't tell anyone. So it's like, how the hell could you know? So that is about as you know, clear uh, evidence as you can get. And I've had several other um, effects of this um, with people that were, you know, in other countries at the time. So, and uh, Persinger, Michael Persinger, that's the name of the professor that has got a theory of telepathy. Michael Persinger, no more secrets. That's the video. I think, I hope it's still up on YouTube, but this was years ago that I've seen it. Anyway, so there you go. And I think, you know, there is a genetic component to this, which I believe there are people that, um, you know, it's interesting. Again, if you, if I think of the last video I did where I'm talking about uh, warrior types and uh, the genetics and the history of people, my family is, comes from at least 800 years of recorded history that we know about where we've always been, uh, you know, not all of us, but generically as, as a family, we have always been um, mercenaries, um, soldiers, uh, soldiers of fortune, you know, and even on my grandmother's side, um, her father was a, um, was a general um, and he was in the box war. I think I've shown people this picture before, uh, but... Um, this is, oh no, that's my granddad. You know, that is my great grandfather on my paternal grandmother's side. And this guy, a really interesting story about him, which I'll tell you in a minute. That's my, my granddad, who's a awesome guy, awesome man. Um, anyway, my, my great grandfather from, uh, he he was the he was my grandmother's dad. He was a crazy character, and he he essentially died because um, not right away, but as a complications of that you know, a little bit later, a couple of years later, I think. Um, he was in, in in one of the wars he was in. There was a sniper shooting officers when they were going to the latrine, and it killed a couple of officers already. Uh, and, you know, the, the, his soldiers were all sort of in the trenches looking out for the sniper. And the, the sniper shot at an officer. And one of the soldiers said, there, you know, if that bastard shoots again, we're going to get him. I know it's there. I saw the flash. It's in that area. If he shoots again, for sure, we're going to get him. Because I'm just going to keep my eyes there until I can see him. 
And uh, my great grandfather, you know, the general, General Gilberti, said to him, Are you sure? And he said, Yes, sir, I'm sure. So he stood up, saluting, took one in the chest, went through his lung. They got the sniper, you know, his fucking general was <laughs> putting himself up there so they can catch the sniper, you know. But uh, brave beyond the point of, of intelligence, you know, it's a genetic trait that unfortunately. Sometimes my father and I have, and I hope my son doesn't. Uh, you know, we, we, we sometimes just don't think about stuff. It's, I don't know if we're that brave. Maybe we're just dumb. I mean, we used to have uh, like lions, you know, in, uh, when growing up. There was a guy that owned a lion farm. And uh, when lion cubs are born in captivity, the male lion tends to kill them. So what we used to do is we, he used to give us these little lion cubs and we'd keep them at our place until they got bigger and then we gave them back. And, uh, you know, lions are awesome animals, man. They're like loyal like a dog, but they're kind of half of a cat and they, they really, um, they're really proud. You know, if, um, if you don't greet them when you come home, they'll get offended. They like won't talk to you for a couple of days, you know. Uh, really awesome animals. But um, anyway, so we had this sort of relationship with lions, you know, and um, I went away, I was away for years and whatever. Then I came back to this town where, um, where this guy was with my uh, first wife and we went to see him at this lion farm and he was in the cage with the lions busy feeding the lions, you know, and there's all the people outside, kind of like a zoo, sort of, you know, all the people outside looking. And, and one, one boy in the crowd goes, Mommy, the pan is with the lions. Can we go in with the lions? And, uh, you know, the guy that's inside the cage is, he's a guy I know, right? He's my dad's friend, whatever. He goes, uh, no, you can't. But, he, and I look at him and I say, hi, hi, you know, hi, Jim, how are you doing? And he looked back and he goes, oh, you're here. Well, you can come in, you know lions. I said, yeah, okay. So I went in and I didn't even think about it. You know, my, my wife was looking at me and she, she didn't say anything. You know, she told me later she, because something happened in the cage <laughs> that I'll get to in a minute. But I asked her like, well, why didn't you say anything if you thought it was dangerous? You know, and she goes, well, I couldn't speak, you know, but I thought, is he so fucking crazy that he's going to walk into a cage of lions, you know? And I did. I walked into the gate, opened the, the little gate, I went in. And so I'm talking and, you know, the lions come to play and I'm ruffling their hair sort of thing. But, you know, it's a big fucking lion and I'm standing, I'm not a small guy. You know, I'm, I'm six foot two. I weigh about 90 kilos then, I guess. I weigh a bit more now. Um, but, uh, you know, so the lion is playing and he's kind of rolling on the floor and stuff. But I'm standing and with one paw, the lion just goes like this and grabs both my legs and whip flips me, you know, and I land in the dirt like a, like a sack of potatoes. And as I land like that, the other lion looks at me and like, don't, don't, don't starts loping towards me because now I'm a sandwich. You know, before I was a human, I was one of the lords. Now, boom, I'm on the floor. Now I'm game, you know, I'm food. And, you know, in that moment, if you hesitate, if you get scared, if you panic, you're done. But I didn't, I just stood up and I was like, hey, to the lion, you know, pointing my finger at the lion, hey, what do you think you're doing? I'm the boss here. And the lion just like, like a cat, you know, like a cat that just got scolded. Just like, whoop, stopped and, and Jim saw it and he was like, oh, <laughs> no, come here to the lion, you know, but it was already, Jim didn't do anything, you know, he, the lion had already stopped. If it was gonna eat me, it was gonna eat me, he wouldn't have done a fucking thing about it. So, but you know, he realized, shit, you know, actually, this might be a bit dangerous. So he said, you know, maybe it's better <laughs> if you leave. And I said, okay, you know, it's your lions. But no, I still played and whatever, and I walked out. And I walked out and I realized, you know, my wife looked a little bit worried, you know, and I said, you, you okay? And she was pale. She said, she said, I thought I was going to faint. I thought, fuck, I'm going to see my husband get eaten by lions. <laughs> you know? And I didn't even think about it. The fact is, I don't know these fucking lions. They don't know me. I've never raised them. I don't know these lions. I was away for years. I, they're not the lions I raised. I don't know who they are. And they don't know who I am. 
I didn't even think about it, you know, just walked in. And then even when the lion like tripped me over, I wasn't like, yeah, I'm not fucking scared, it's a goddamn lion. You know, bitch slapped the lion. Not that I could, you know, but in my mind, it's like, well, fuck the lion, you know. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why my family line have been sort of soldiers, adventurers, or explorers and weird guys for, for so long. And uh, in some way, I think the the high IQ craziness. I think we probably had to have high IQ just to survive because the crazy shit we get up to, you know, it's, it's a wonder we're not all dead. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's just one of those weird things, but, um, yeah. So precognition and possibly high IQ and the genetics of it are quite in, interesting topic so i just thought i'll let you guys know a little bit about it and uh, you know if you want the more details it's like i said it's in the book but um, i don't care you don't need to buy the book so i'm just shooting the shit with you guys um i quite like the uh you know the 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 people that watch my my channel i quite enjoy them there's um one guy who his his screen name or whatever is tony gut and he told me he went back to church with this seven-year-old. And I think, if I remember right, he's only 27-year-old guy. So that was a really cool message to receive. So thank you for letting me know that. For letting me know that I inspired you to go back to church. That's great. Um, I'm trying a new thing, which is a... I'm, I think I'm going to do a little documentary. A documentary series. So I don't know when that'll be done. It'll probably take a while. But I've started to do the little intro and uh, getting somebody to try and put together a little bit more professional thing than just me talking on the phone. Not much more professional, but, you know, maybe like a couple of titles and shit. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and, yeah, that's sort of it. I mean, now that I'm in the swing of things, I almost feel like going off on a rant about something. But, um, now I'll just say, I've, I've watched the last two or three... Uh, videos that uh, Owen has done and they're awesome man like the, the guy just cracked me up sometimes he'll just come up with something so hilarious while he's just ranting that it 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 uh you know I'm not one to lol but uh he does make me literally laugh my ass off sometimes you know he's, he's I just burst out laughing like that that's hilarious man so the, the stuff he comes up with is um <laughs> it's really great like his insults and rants you know, I find it so entertaining because it reminds me of the way that uh, I, my brother and my friends from, you know, where I grew up in Africa do. Uh, it reminds me of the way we mess around with each other, joke with each other, talk shit with each other, you know, criticize somebody or take the piss. It's uh, it's funny and uh, and, you know, not 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 politically correct little bullshit nonsense. It's uh, it's very entertaining. So um I'm sure most of the people that are here know who Owen Benjamin is, but if there's a couple of you that don't, go look at his stuff. He's he's great. Um, and what else? Well, that's well, maybe that'll be it. I'll try and keep it to like, hey, not even an hour. I'm I'm doing better. You know, I'll, I might do some short ones one of these days. A good night. Have a good week.